Uh, very good morning to you. And uh, it is, as usual, my great pleasure uh, to be doing a Tip TV CEO interview. And even more of a pleasure to welcome back Dr. Robert Trice, CEO of uh, Hurricane Energy. Morning, Robert. How good are morning, you? Good morning, welcome. I'm pretty relaxed, thank you. Good. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, where on earth do I start with this interview with, uh, with Robert? Because it's been one hell of a year. I mean, we were talking a few seconds ago about you know, what the share price was in IP or something a year ago. So much has happened. Robert, normally I would say to somebody, give us a you know, thumbnail sketch of the company, but uh, we haven't got all day. <laughs> and uh, it's been such a year. Uh, why don't you give us a glance back from this time last year to now? So just, in, just in brief of the, what's yeah, happened. Well, basically, you know, January, February, we were looking at a very tough year. No ability to raise money, no ability to do anything, not even drill a well or anything. And the whole industry was staring at its navel with low oil price. And uh, we built a relationship with Kerogen, and basically that cash injection changed the company. And <coughs> four worlds later, uh, here we are. That's an amazing, uh, amazing year. Yeah. Now... You say four wells. I mean, the, the interesting thing is that at the time you were discussing farm ins, but um, you know, the, the reluctance of the people to farm in meant that the uh, the raise from Kerogen was, was so much more important because you could do those wells. Why don't we run through uh, how the drilling uh, campaign went? I mean, obviously, it's probably worth starting uh, with Lancaster, where you were clearly drilling to. Uh, to get some more certainty behind something which you pretty much knew about already, uh, but to give an idea that you wanted to narrow the CPR uh, and understand uh, what it contained. So, so talk us through starting with Lancaster. Okay, well, Lancaster was two wells. The first well was really to find how deep the oil went down to. What was the oil water contact? We had a good idea from the four well, but we wanted, which was our first well, we wanted to demonstrate that that interpretation was correct. We found that the contact where we expected it, and then uh, so that was a, a, a big success for us. The well also flowed at a very high rate, and then we sidetracked that well to put our second horizontal well in. Because the question, quite rightly, from investors was that okay, you've drilled a horizontal well back in 2014, it flowed at very high rates, but you know, is that a one off? So we uh, demonstrated it wasn't a one off, and we got even higher flow rates. So we were able on Lancaster not only to confirm what we thought about the reservoir, but end up with now two wells ready for tieback. So that's a, a major step forward. And one of the, uh, I suppose, the important things about that Lancaster, that first Lancaster well, once we confirmed that where the oil was, we were then able to plan to make an out-of-round application uh, for what turned out to be Halifax. Yeah. So uh, that was a key point. Good. Well, I'll come back to Halifax in a minute, and I'll also come back to numbers and so on. But but the good thing is that with the discoveries on Lancaster and the way you managed, you've managed to increase the your uh, view of recoverable reserves of five to five hundred ninety three million barrels, which is exceptional. And in particular, you were saying at the capital markets day on Friday that you're using a twenty five percent recovery rate, mm -hmm. which is. You know, some people would have said that it might have been quite high by historical standards, but when you talked about it, you said that 25 to 40 was more likely. So you're not being sort of optimistic, saying 25% no, recovery rate. And I'd just like to say that because I know people ask the question. No, that's a very fair question. If you look at global uh, fields, it doesn't matter what kind of reservoir, the average is 30% recovery. And we know from uh, research we, we've uh, read and conversations and with experts, etc., that recovery factors in excess of 50% for fractured basement are achievable. So we put the 25% as our base case. It's what we would or would aim to achieve. And of course, like anything, the more you find out about a field, the more you can elevate the recovery factor because, yeah. as we all know, small fields get smaller and big fields get bigger. So I think that uh, the 25% uh, is, a, is a good, sensible thing to aim for, a good target. And, of course, the potential for 35% is, yeah. is there. It's the carrot. Yeah. Can we get a billion barrels out of that Lancaster? That is, of course, what our, you know, us as a management team would be striving to achieve. Excellent. Now, I'd like to talk about the Halifax well because, uh, for a number of reasons, I mean, 
because a lot of people say to me, what on earth happened to it? Because it was taking quite a long time. We had all those rumours about sidetrack and that sort of stuff, which you very kindly on a quiet day at Edinburgh Airport, you managed to yeah. put people's mind to rest. But there was a plan at, at one stage to use the DST to bring some oil to surface, which didn't happen. And in the, 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 the set of slides that you gave us on Friday, you showed us a whopping great section which was full of gunk and, and rubbish, which you said, I think, was that the drilling fluid was compromised. Mm -hmm. So talk us through that, the Halifax well. OK, I will. I mean, <laughs> we had absolutely no trouble drilling the well. And so all this blather in the press about sidetracks was completely unfounded. Yeah. Um, the DST was designed to bring oil to surface. It wasn't designed as a commercial flow rate or anything like that because this well is an exploration well and it's designed to find out you know, where the oil is and uh, you know, how much we got, basically. Um, but yes, we were unable to clean the well up. Uh, we tried a number of techniques, nitrogen and, and base oil, which basically you replace the drilling fluid in the, in the, in the column with a, a lighter fluid and, and the, basically the, the, the thing should flow. But... Uh, the combination of the drilling brine, which is heavier than we have used on Lancaster, and the reason for that is, is this is an exploration well and we're obliged to have heavier yeah, fluid yeah. in the event as a blowout. I mean, I would, don't want to be sitting here <laughs> having an interview and saying, why did you have a blowout? Uh, yeah. well, but that's, that's, not, uh, that's, not, that's not good. And, and some people suggested that it was an overbalanced well. Which yes, it, well, it was. Yeah, it was, it was overbalanced. Unusual, yeah. Number one, we don't know the pressure. We, we assume a certain pressure. So you yeah. have a safety threshold above which the, the heavy, um, uh, he relatively heavy mud is designed to accommodate. But what we found in, uh, is that uh, the, the nature of drilling, uh, Halifax, created a series of fines, which basically mixed with the, the mud and created a, well, almost like a porridge. Now, we had experienced similar, um, slim, similar reactions on, on previous wells, but not to this extent. And I think it's basically... a a combination of the, of the additional heavy weight to the mud uh, and therefore it's not cleaning up as, uh, as, yeah. it, as it could. So we've taken samples of the mud, we're analysing it <laughs> and we will watch this space, we'll have an answer. But that is the, uh, that's what we believe has happened. Brilliant. Now obviously the, the talking points have been Lancaster and Halifax but I don't want to leave Warwick and Lincoln out. I'm it's glad to hear that. Warwick Malcolm. area yeah. as you call it. I mean I was pretty bullish about the Greater Warwick area when I looked at them at the numbers. Um, perhaps you could give us a run through what's yeah. that, what, what that is all about. Well, it's, again, it's a, it's a case, it's the mystery of, I suppose, media. The, uh, when we did our R&S on, on Lincoln and the GWA, Greater Warwick area, it was at Christmas time and nobody paid any attention. <laughs> Whereas Halifax, of course, was uh, hit, hit a, a media sweet spot. Potentially, the Lincoln and the Greater Warwick area could be bigger uh, than Lancaster, Halifax combined. So, yes, it is massively exciting. Uh, again, we don't know where the oil water content is. We've got an oil down to. Uh, the properties of Lincoln uh, appear to be exactly the same as Lancaster. I can't say they are, but they appear to be. We've got a whole bunch of core data, uh, which is currently in the lab, being evaluated. And we're looking forward to being able to uh, provide an update on, on our resource numbers uh, you know, later in the year, either, either possibly as management update, but certainly as a revised CPR for that uh, discovery. Excellent. Two quick questions just to finish that bit off. First of all, the, the map show Whirlpool, which looked like it might have been a feed for, uh, for, for one of the other well, well, Halifax. You know, yes. it's difficult to tell from, from, from the layman, but you were saying that yes. it might. So basically, Whirlwind, which is another one of our discoveries. I call it Whirlpool, didn't Whirlpool I? West. Whirlwind. No worries. No, worries. no worries. <laughs> Whirlwind's another 200 million barrels of discovery. Yeah. Another. I mean, it's embarrassing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and again, we have not drilled deep enough to find out where the all water contact is. So there's potentially, as hydrocarbons come into Whirlwind, they fill the structure and they can spill. And the most direct spill route is up towards Halifax. Yeah. So, um, yes, that, that's potentially a, 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 a source for the oil of Halifax. Um, but we mustn't forget that the whole Kimmeridge clay abutting the, the Rona Ridge yeah. in Halifax all the way down to Lincoln and Warwick <coughs> is, is producing oil today. So that oil is migrating in into the ridge. Now, I don't want to give yeah. guys the impression it's coming at hundreds of <laughs> barrels a day. It's not. It's coming at a, at a geological rate, but it is a yeah. dynamic system. And that's one of the uh, things we have to consider about, you know, in our exploration modelling. What could that dynamism be, be doing to the re re reservoir and particularly the ridge?
Yeah, excellent. And just finally on the drilling, everyone was talking about tilted water contact uh, on Friday. Tell me about that. Well, that's our fault, and we did say it's our model. <laughs> Basically, there are a number of models for trapping oil at Halifax and at Lancaster in the same structure. Um, one is, is the, the whole thing is connected. Uh, alternatively, you can have a barrier between Lancaster and Halifax. So we have taken the simplest model first, which is a straight line model. If you draw a, a line between Halifax or water contact and uh, Lancaster or, uh, or, or water contact, that's a straight line. Can you provide a model? A tilted or water contact is a, is, is a model that would ex explain that. We don't hang our hat on it, uh, but it, we currently cannot find a barrier between Lancaster and Halifax. Um, we can see lots of faults, but let's not forget it. We drill faults to produce oil. Yeah. Our faults are not seals, our faults are high quality reservoir. Yeah. So in fact, there's a bunch yeah. of faults between Lancaster and Halifax. It's very difficult to me to stand up and say, well, I think one of those is a barrier. Yeah. You know, you get laughed out of court. <laughs> so the fact that we can't see one doesn't mean there isn't one there. Lovely. It will require additional appraisal drilling, pressure measurements between Halifax and Lancaster. Uh, Lancaster. And if there is a barrier, it's great news because it most likely means that the that the Halifax volume is even e even greater yeah. than we're, we're currently ascribing to it. That's brilliant. You've explained that absolutely fantastically. Thank you very much Cheers. indeed. CPR. A lot of people are talking about CPR and when's it going to happen and everything mm -hmm. else. Now, you've got a whole bunch of fresh data coming mm -hmm. in now from Halifax well, um, but you've got a fi an FID to make by the end of the mm -hmm. this quarter. Yes. Um, I'm assuming that you'll need some sort of CPR in order to make that FID decision, yes. but you won't be able to have the whole thing. Can I, am I right in thinking you're going to have like a, an interim yes, you are. CPR to publish and then a, final, a bigger one at the end of the year? Exactly. Well, to be honest, we had anticipated the CPR would be published. I'm afraid that's uh, mea culpa, uh, extended results, uh, extended drilling on Halifax, and that extended drilling was because we had to you know, drill deeper and deeper to find this oil down to. Um, that meant that uh, our technical guys weren't available to the uh, CPR team in the way they should have, you know, we had planned yeah, to yeah. do. So it has been delayed. We anticipate the CPR being out this month. And it will be just on Lancaster alone. So that's just the Lancaster field. And you're correct, later in the year we will be uh, expecting another CPR which will cover all our other assets. And yes, it takes a very long time to evaluate all that well data. Yeah. Let's not face it, we've got four wells, uh, three of which have got core data, which is time consuming to evaluate. And they're all being processed and analysed as we speak. So I've got a very busy six months ahead of me and, and so is a technical team, yeah. integrating, evaluating, etc. Excellent. Uh, I just briefly want to talk about the uh, EPS because um, it has been described as um, more of a, what I call a, a, a money-making data-gathering process um, uh, ahead of the full field development mm. rather than just saying, I mean, when it first started, I thought people were saying, right, EPS is good because it can bring production on as soon as 2019. You start getting some money and everything else. But actually, it's turning into... Something slightly different, isn't it? You're going to be producing 17,000 barrels a day uh, and, and it'll be on the way to a full field development. Is that, is that right? Well, basically, it was always planned as a data gathering exercise. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, the prime, the pro it has to generate money. We can't, we can't have an experiment that costs us money. I mean, that is, that's lunacy. And the shareholders and uh, me being a shareholder wouldn't be very happy. So yes, it has to generate revenue. But the true value, and that's a, you know, that's a, it's not a monetary term necessarily, is the data it will gather to allow us to optimally uh, develop the full field Blankster. If you've got a potential uh, billion barrels, as an example, um, you can't just go and ad hoc put wells randomly in and uh, in the wrong place. Yeah. So the whole point of the EPS technically is to find out how the reservoir behaves, whether there's communication in a specific direction. We call that uh, uh, permeability anisotropy, which is just a, a fl technical term for fl flow in a specific yep. direction. Do we have that? Or is the thing so well connected that it just uh, goes out in a nice sphere <laughs> of pressure? <laughs> so all those kind of things uh, we'll be evaluating, doing inter interference tests, and we'll be finding out how well these horizontal wells can produce, because we mustn't forget we tested them for a relatively short period of time. We don't think they've necessarily cleaned up, and potentially they could produce at even greater rates than we're we're, we're currently modelling. Yeah. So we are being, again, 
we're not being we're not over egging it yet, and we're going in with a sensible producible rate which may increase good um just briefly, I, I, I promise I wouldn't ask about the financing because that's, you've got a CFO for that. Absolutely right. So we know that there will be, I mean, the numbers the other day were something like $467 million. Yep. Now, obviously, there's bound to be some sort of equity and um, a debt process. Um, a, a, the, fi the finance director says that the, you, know, you can definitely get senior debt. More importantly, the sort of third leg of that will be a farming or farming mm -hmm. out to somebody else. That process is ongoing at the moment again, and you said uh, at the weekend that there were a lot of uh, people um, in, in the data room. Can you give us a rough idea of what the process is at the moment? I, can, not I, I, I won't give you, of not give you numbers and names, but the process is, is very different to, to previously um, held uh, data rooms. Uh, there's far more of an acceptance of the model and of the oil down to and the porosities and all, all the things that were questioned uh, prior to these two wells last year. Um, and really the discussion isn't so much about what's there, it's about optimization. How do we best um, bring it on? Obviously the EPS is stage one, but with a farming partner there's parallel drilling, a parallel appraisal drilling. I mean, having Lancaster and then Halifax up the ridge, and well obviously there's going to be oil between the two trapped in some mechanism well if there is a barrier and you put a, a, a production system in phase one production system EPS and Lancaster some of that oil is going to go in so all these are the sort of questions we, we're looking at and also G, you know, GWA Lancaster sorry Lincoln and, and Warwick appraisal drilling on yeah. them I mean it's nine kilometers away from Lancaster <laughs> you're not going to have a full field development just Lancaster by itself that's bonkers so yeah. These are the questions that are being raised and discussed and uh, how Brilliant. to fast track that full field development. Um, we're, we're going really well, but as ever, we're, we're running out of time a little bit. There is one thing I wanted to, to, to hit you with, because I read an article uh, recently from the Harriet Watt University people, which looked, I won't, I won't gloss on it because it didn't look too special, but it said that this sort of thing can only work in theory um, and uh, it'll have rapid production decline and everything else. Um, well, you read it. What did you think? You need to dispel the uh, those dreadful, well, uh, all incorrect I can, fallacies. All I can say that the uh, that the authors of that article clearly ha didn't re read the uh, Schlumberger uh, simulation model uh, that we commissioned and uh, haven't a got access to the data that we have. I mean, basically, all the information indicates that we're going to plateau with no uh, for a very long time with no uh, water production. And as I've said repeatedly, you know, water is a, uh, a fallacy. It's, it's an old hangover from olden day times when guys were <laughs> drilling uh, fractured basements with no 3D seismic, no idea where the fractures were. They weren't using horizontal wells. They were using vertical wells. They were pumping them hard. They were being greedy in, in accessing the oil. And as a result, oh, and then, oh, yeah, compounding that, they uh, in, inject water. And now all these things we're not doing. You know, we are designing the Lancaster field development from day one with horizontal wells, with low drawdown rates, we've got a nice light oil, 38 API, we've got massive hydrocarbon oil column, we've got no barriers according to all our dynamic data, and we are designing it to optimise uh, recovery factor and to mitigate against water. And if we do get water, simply choke back the wells, process any water using the, uh, the Akamazoo's uh, a water processing plant, and uh, away we go. But there's absolutely no data to suggest we will get early water. Thank you very much for taking that on. Robert, I'm already aware that I'm um, running into, into dangerous overtime here. Um, what I always ask uh, my victims is, at the very end, is to just give a, a, a vision. You've told us so much here about what's happened in such a short space. And, you know, before we know it, it's going to be 2019 and you'll be producing. Give us your... Um, short to medium term vision for what's going to happen to Hurricane? Well the short medium term is to get the EPS away, get producing and basically uh, instigate a, an appraisal plan that can fast track the full field development. Now whether that is involving uh, Halifax, Lincoln, Warwick, Whirlwind, that's yet to be seen but uh, my vision would we, we would be uh, uh, very 2020-21 have a clear plan to what the next stage of the full field development would be. That would be, that would be my vision. Very much focused on the Rona Ridge. Of course, we've got other ideas, but this is not the medium for that. <laughs>
Thank you very much. And the Oil and Gas Association have said that the Hurricane Basin Bay is the key next step in UK oil and gas, so you should be very pleased with that. Before you go, I'm going to remind you of something that you said on Friday. In a, in a, in a quiet moment, you actually said that uh, you described Lancaster as being a rock and roll grandma um, and that uh, it's very old but it's very generous. Absolutely you, indeed. And you still believe that? And she's got a lot of life on her left. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, two and a half billion year old reservoir. What's more to like, eh? Fantastic. Brilliant. Dr. Robert Trice, thank you very much for coming in thank again. As ever, it's been a great pleasure. Cheers. Thank you very much. This has been Tip TV CEO Interviews.